Thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel Adams. I am the Chief Curator and Director of Programs at the Venus Center. I'm trying to get my full screen here. Okay. Um, and we are here for Lunch and Learn with the Great Plains Black History Museum. Um, I'm going to just show a few slides about what's coming up at Bemis, and then I'll do an intro, and then I will hand it over to Eric and Matt. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to chat them in, um, and we'll also use the chat to link to some things as well. Um, and um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions. You can chat me directly or chat the whole group. So. Um, for those of you who may be interested in coming down to Bemis this week, um, on Thursday night at 7 p.m., we are actually having um, in-person um, art talks with our summer residents. So we have an amazing group of residents with us this summer, and we'll actually be doing these um, in person at Lowen, which is our, our venue, our music venue, which we opened in late 2019. So not many people have have been down there. Um, it's a really great space and um, this is a free event. You can come a little early to see the exhibition that's on view, which I'll talk about in a minute and then come down to low end at 7 p.m. So that is what is happening this week, uh, as well as this event <laughs> that we're in right now, of course. Um, next week, we are starting a new series called Art and Practice, the Intersection of Poetry and Visual Art. Um, and so we're starting that off with a lecture by um, Jenny Kilter, who's a professor at NYU. She'll be sort of giving an overview of the, the history um, between poets and visual artists working together. Um, and then we'll have later on in August, two conversations with two of the artists that are in um, the All Together Amongst Many Reflections on Empathy exhibition. Um, so those details are forthcoming. But if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this history, um, you can join us for this Zoom presentation on August 10th at 7 p.m. August 12th is the return of Low End on the Bricks, um, which is an outdoor free uh, concert that we'll have outside on the street outside of Bemis. So um, right in front of our um, building, we'll have that blocked off. You can bring chairs, you can bring some food. We'll have Four artists um, playing. Elisa Harkins is actually going to be joining us. She's coming in from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the rest of um, the artists are all local to Omaha. Um, it's going to be a really fun night. We did this last summer um, and had a great response, and so we're just going to keep that magic going. Um, so if you want to come, you can RSVP or you can just show up. We're not having a capacity limit or anything, but you will want to bring something to sit on. Um, so like a folding, you know, camp chair or something like that. Um, and then just as a reminder, this is kind of a two-part series. So Eric will be talking with Preston Love Jr. on September 7th um, at noon. So please come back for that. Um, and as you can see in this picture, this kind of is a segue into um, what we are, um, what we have up in our exhibition right now, um, a work by the artist Glenn Ligon um, called um, um, untitled, but I am a man is sort of the um, parentheses and it's based off of the, the signs that um, the Memphis sanitation strikers were working in this image or were, were holding in this image. So you can see that here. Um, oops, sorry, skipped one. Um, so just so you know, our summer exhibition, um, the main exhibition is up until September 19th. We actually just closed the Charlie Friedman soundtracks for the present future. But next week, we'll be opening a short run of um, four amazing sound suits by the artist Nick Cave um, in our back gallery. So definitely come back um, to see those in person. They are amazing. They're all owned by um, private collectors here in Omaha, Council Bluffs, and um, Lincoln. So this is the first time they'll all be together. Um, and there'll be a film by Nick Cave playing as well. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, um, please um, take, a, take a quick look. We can put some links in the chat. Um, Nick is an artist based in Chicago. He's, he's world renowned and um, will actually be coming to Omaha um, as part of a summer fundraiser that Bemis is hosting, but we'll be streaming live the conversation that he'll have with our executive director. So there's information about that, which we'll share in the chat. Um, but again, these are unbelievable objects. Um, and Nick actually started creating this work in response to the Rodney King um, police beating um, in the 90s. So it was sort of 
stems all from that um, and has an amazing history. So I'll send, I'll put a link in the chat to learn more about that as well. Um, so we just want to thank you for being here. Um, and if you um, are interested in our programs, please follow us um, on social media, sign up for our email list, and you can support us at this link. Um, and um, yeah, so here is um, sort of the Great Plains Black History Museum shared this image with us, and this is what we're going to be talking about today. But I wanted to um, kind of showcase this um, installation shot of uh, our gallery right now um, and talk a little bit briefly just about the exhibition that's on view. Um, Altogether Amongst Many Reflections on Empathy explores the cultural and sociopolitical issues currently defining the United States um, and that have been defining them for decades. Um, presented on the heels of the 2020 elections, the work of the artist takes various approaches during these polarizing times. They're based, um, artists are based across the United States and Canada and through their diverse unique perspective, broadly engaged ideas centered on land rights, indigenous rights, climate change and the environment, food justice, accessibility, healthcare, immigration and migration, systematic racism, LGBTQ rights, um, the criminal justice system, police brutality, violence on all accounts, and of course, civil rights. Um, Glenn Ligon's paintings and sculptures examine cultural and socio social identity through found sources. So literature, Afrocentric coloring books, and photographs, um, revealing the ways in which his, the history of slavery, the civil rights movement, and sexual politics have informed our understanding of American society. Um, he's appropriated texts from a variety of historical literary writers, including Walt Whitman, Zora Neale Hurston, Gertrude Stein, and James Baldwin, as well as the comedian Richard Pryor. Um, this piece, this diptych, is a reproduction of one of Ligon's earliest based um, text-based pieces entitled I Am a Man from 1988, which of course borrowed from the phrase I am a man from one of the most famous moments in American civil rights movement of the 1960s. Um, as I said, the text, um, these posters were carried um, during the 1968 Memphis sanitation workers strike, a month long event that helped men achieve better pay, safer working conditions and the right to union representation. Um, this was also um, right at the time when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, delivered his famous mountaintop speech um, just before being assassinated in Memphis on April 4th, 1968. Um, Ligon first saw this phrase um, at the office of the US Congressman Charles Rangel, um, which had significant impact on him. Um, and he now um, is uh, obviously, he's a, he's a world renowned artist as well. Um, and the painting as well as um, the original set of this diptych is in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Um, what also sort of came up when we um, started working on this, having this piece in the show was that um, even prior to this, um, Chief Standing Bear, when he was on trial here in Nebraska has a famous um, quote where he says, that hand is not the color of yours, but if I prick it, the blood will flow and I shall feel pain. The blood is the same color as yours. God made me and I am a man. So that is sort of even a precursor to, um, to the sign being used. So with that, no further ado, I will turn it over to, um, to Eric Ewing, the director of the Great Plains Black History Museum and to Matt Holland. So thank you all for joining us. Good afternoon, thanks for uh, having us. And uh, everyone, thank you. we wanna thank you for taking your lunch and to spend a little time with us to learn a little bit about the local history as it pertains to the civil rights movement and one of the organizations. Uh, today we, we have Matt Holland, who will be uh, talking about uh, the history of the DePores Club. And so I wanna open up to Matt and, and start off with, uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your, your, your affiliation with the uh, DePores Club? You bet, thanks Eric. And first off, thank you Eric for this invitation. and. Thank you to the Bemis Center for this series. Um, it's, it's a joy to be part of it. Um, I was telling Rachel earlier, I 
I've been telling the story of the Forest Club to anybody that'll listen since about 2005. And I, I jump at every opportunity. So thank you for this. And again, Eric, thank you for the invite. Um, my connection to the DePorris Club is through my family. Um, the the um, DePorris Club was formed um, in the late 1940s and the one of the co-founders and then the president for seven years was my father, Denny Holland. And also my mother was the secretary of the DePorris Club. So they met through the DePorris Club. So I have a a family connection. And then um, through a series of events, I ended up doing some research and learning more about the DePorris Club. Um, I, I'm an elementary teacher and um, administrator by uh, profession. I was in the OPS for about 24 years. And so the idea of educating people about this story appealed to me in for a couple of reasons. One is um, to just to get the story out there. But also as I shared the story, I found out over and over, people had not heard of it. So um, I've been spending time trying to make people in Omaha and nationally aware of this story. So this is a, a great opportunity. And like I said, I've been doing it for well over 10 years, um, elementary schools, high schools, junior highs, universities, um, uh, I don't think he may have froze, froze up. Matt, are you there? Well, the next thing I was going to say, say to him, I guess, uh, because of the DePores Club, that's why Matt is here today. Without the DePores Club, obviously, his 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 mom, mom and dad met while, while participating with the DePores Club. So, go ahead, Matt. Am I back? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, the DePores Club began, like I said, in 1947 here in Omaha. And I always uh, preface the story of the DePores Club with it. It was, it was in a place that you would have never expected at a time you would have never expected with a group of people that you would have never expected. 1947, Omaha, Nebraska. You don't tend to think that's you know, when you think of civil rights in the United States, that's not definitely the first place or the first time period that comes to mind. So it's unique in that where it happened and when it happened. I'm going to share a quick picture of uh, taken back in 1948 of the members of the DePores Club. Yeah, and that... You, uh, that photo was taken on the steps of the Creighton um, University Administration Building in January of 1948. And those are some of the original members. They had just started meeting in the previous, at the previous November, November 3rd of 47. And you can see in that photo, the gentleman in the black cassock is a Jesuit priest. He was a Creighton professor. His name was uh, John Marcou. And he was, for all intents and purposes, he is the what would have never happened. Um, but the gentleman to his right or your left in the plaid shirt with the glasses is my late dad, Denny Holland. And those two bonded. And like I said, my dad was the president for seven years and he and father, John Marcou, became very close. And you can see in that photograph that it's a, it's a mix of black and white, young and old, men and women, um, which that alone in 1947, 1948 was incredibly unusual. And then to have that group challenging the racial norms in Omaha, they were, um, Father Marcoux later said they were called troublemakers, agitators, communists, um, anything that you could put on them as a negative, they, they were labeled with that because they were doing things that not just in Omaha, but nationally were ahead of their time. Yeah. So what, what, was, what was the DePores Club's mission? When they first, my, my dad actually, he was 20, I, I, he would have been about 21. He had just been uh, left the Navy. He was training to be a, a pilot in the Navy. World War II came to an end, he was discharged came to Creighton on the GI Bill. Um, 
he remembered when he said he thought he was joining a prayer club. Um, and so it was, he had some interest in racial justice matters and he was direct, he was um, referred to Father Mark, Mark who, who had decades of experience and efforts in racial justice matters in the church and in society. I think the mission was to expand the understanding between blacks and whites. It was a very gentle, kind of a safe, vanilla statement of, but very quickly, my dad and the members found out that Father Mark had much bigger intentions of, of what the club would end up doing. But when they first met, they, they made it to where the statement was that it was just to kind of talk about racial matters and to get yeah. those African-American members where many of them were Catholics from St. Benedict's, the more Catholic church in Omaha. So it, it, the, it had a very Catholic flavor early on, you know, Catholic priests, first majority of the members were Catholics. And, but then that changed over a, a very short period of time. And so the, 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 the name DePores, uh, what's the history behind the name? Thank you for that. Uh, um, there's a Catholic saint, his name is Martin DePores. He was uh, a Dominican monk in Peru in the late 1500s. And of mixed race, his father was a Spaniard, his mother was a freed slave and he is one of the few after, uh, biracial or black saints in the Catholic church. And he is seen as the patron saint of interracial justice. And so the DePorce Club chose to name, the group chose to take his name as the name of their group in honor of him being the patron saint of interracial justice, yeah. Now, uh, you said the, uh, the, the organization started on the campus of Creighton University. Did it always reside on Creighton? <laughs> um, no, so, some people would tell you that Creighton kicked the DePores Club off of campus. I tend to say that the leadership of Creighton Yeah, there, there is some some folks, as um, Matt was saying, uh, believe that Creighton uh, kicked, they were kicked off the campus of Creighton uh, University. What I've been told is that they were dismissed from the campus of Creighton University, but, uh, and then they, they held their meetings down at the, uh, in the north, uh, north, north part of Omaha. I believe uh, some of those meetings were held at, uh, at the, uh, Omaha Star. You back, Matt? Take your mute. Okay. You were, yeah, you were telling us uh, the what happened with them as far as being on the campus of Creighton. Yeah, um, basically the the Deporce Club was stirring up and enough trouble where they were getting phone. The Creighton University president was getting phone calls wanting to know about who the DePores Club, who they were and what, why were they were meeting on the Creighton campus. So they came to an understanding, it was about a year after they had started meeting that it was time for the DePores Club to find another place to meet. And so they, uh, Father Mark Koo, who was very familiar with North Omaha and had a lot of contacts in North Omaha, found a storefront for them to rent on 24th and Grace, and they moved off of the Creighton campus and opened a storefront on 24th and Great Grace, and that became their headquarters from about 1948 to about 1950. So, in other words, they were get, they were getting some starting some good trouble. They were um, when John L. Lewis said that I smiled because that's exactly what they were doing. They were, you know, who are these people? Why are they coming? Um, it was early on, it was the Catholic Church. Why are these people coming to my church and asking me if I would admit black parishioners or black students? And um, th that was 
the St. Benedict, the more ch Catholic church, if you're familiar with the Catholic church in Omaha, almost every big city in the United States that had a African-American Catholic population had a segregated black church. Um, and St. Benedict the Moor was the segregated black church for Catholic, black Catholics in Omaha. And the DePores the Club was trying to convince neighboring churches to allow blacks into their schools and into their parishes. And that didn't go over well in 1947, 1948. And that was part of the reason. The other part of the reason was if you look at that photograph, there are young black men with young white women and young black women with young white men meeting unchaperoned. That caught the attention of people. My dad remembered there was the, the Omaha Police Department had a, a, a unit called the Morals Squad. And they would um, come across these officers who would follow them down North 24th Street um, would sometimes attend their meetings because of that social more of that that you know the, the interracial dating and all of all of what that could have uh, led to as well. So they were stirring up enough trouble where Creighton didn't wasn't interested in um, managing that. And it actually Father Marcou took the opportunity and he saw that as a, a, a way to move forward, move away from Creighton and move away from the Catholic Church and make it more of a secular organization. So that actually, he sees that opportunity and that had they not moved off the Creighton campus, they never probably would have done the things that they ended up doing over the next six years. Now, I was also told they had held some of their meetings uh, at the Omaha Star, am I correct with that? Y yes, so they, they were on Creighton campus for about a year. They had their storefront. Um, for about two years and they weren't able to keep the rent. I think it was $40 a month. They weren't able, they, the, they just, all, they, they couldn't keep the rent. They couldn't do the fundraising and they had, they closed the center in 1950, the end of the summer of 1950. And they met at the North Omaha YMCA for a short period of time. And then Mildred Brown, the publisher of the Omaha Star um, offered her offices at the Star on 24th Street. And for the next four years, that was their headquarters. So can you share a little bit uh, with us about uh, a little bit of history about uh, Father uh, Markle? Uh, he, um, John Marcou was born in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota in 1890. He graduated from West Point in 1914. Um, he was an all-star football player, uh, played uh, end at, for the Army football team. And uh, he was in, in a book by uh, Dwight Eisenhower's grandson. Um, Dwight Eisenhower is quoted as saying, John Marcou was the best potential officer he, Eisenhower, had ever seen. Um, Marcou did have one fault that he, it, quickly ended his military career, he was, and for the remainder of his life, was a raging alcoholic. Um, and he he was brought up on charges and had his commission removed in 1915, just less than a year after he was commissioned as a lieutenant out of West Point. And he happened to have a younger brother who was in the uh, Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, and his younger brother convinced him to join the Jesuits. So in 1916, John Marcou joined his brother William at a Catholic seminary outside of St. Louis and spent the next 50 years as a Jesuit priest. And by the time he'd come to Omaha, he and his brother William took a pledge with two other Jesuits. Um, I, anyway, they took a pledge to dedicate their lives to work for the conversion and the salvation of the Negro in the United States. So their initial motivation was to convert African Americans to the Catholic Church. And, you know, as young Jesuits, they were thinking we can convert all of these new church members. Well, they quickly came to understand that they were converting African Americans to a church that was just as racially segregated and, and 
um, as racist as the, the society of the United States. So then they started to work to change that inside of the church. And they took that pledge. And for the next 50 years, John and his brother William were uh, to, to go back to John L. Lewis, made good wherever they went. They were assigned to Marquette University or University of Denver or St. Louis University. They were constantly pushing people to change the way they accepted African Americans. Um, John Marcoux was one of the major players in getting St. Louis University to admit Black students in 1944. Um, then when he came to Omaha in 46, he picked right up with the DePoris Club and continued. So when he started the DePoris Club, he'd been doing that for close to 30 years. Some version of when he, he was actually at Creighton in 1931 and started a group on the Creighton campus for the handful of uh, black students at Creighton University. So um, he had a, a long career of trying to make a difference in the church and in society. Now, you said your father was uh, the uh, student president. What were some of the other roles that he played? And uh, how do you feel, uh, think they, you know, his, his involvement with the DePores Club impacted him later in life? And, if, and in what ways? Oh, it, 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 he would have never been who he was had he not met Father Marcu and joined that club. Um, for the rest of his life, like I said, until Father Marcu died in 67, they were, I, I don't, I've never, maybe almost like father son, but definitely mentor, mentee. He became very close with Father Marcu um, and, and learned a lot from him, but became, he did his own version of, of uh, making good trouble and um, spent, I, there was a quote that I found from my dad. He was interviewed in say the eighties and he was talking about the early days of the forest club. He said they were thinking that what they needed to do was to lift the black community. So they gave out clothes and they had food drives and, you know, a very salvation, you know, come in and help these people type of a mindset. And he, my dad said very quickly, and this was with Father Marcoux, he made it a point that, that their headquarters was in North Omaha, that they, they weren't just talking about it, they're experiencing and meeting people. And my dad said he very quickly realized it wasn't about uplifting the black community, it was about, and the, the, this is a direct quote, it was about getting the white community to get their feet off of the black necks, the necks of the black community, which I posted actually after George Floyd. Um, it, so they, they realized that it wasn't about uplift, it was about getting, raising the, the ceiling to get people to have an opportunity. North Omaha was, um, there was no infrastructure. There was basically no policing. It was, I mean, the term ghetto was, th that was the ghetto of Omaha. And it was, it, it got little or no attention from this, this city outside of that community. Um, and so my dad, there's, there was a quote from my dad and Eric, I've shared this with you that he was after years and years of trying to make a difference. And they really, and truly, if you look back at what they did, they didn't move the dial that much even they were, you know, even though they were pushing for all that time and my dad's sitting in a bar on North 24th street and there's a guy sitting with him and my dad's having a beer and he, he, he was discouraged. And he said to the guy next to him, he said, you know, I'm thinking about crossing back over. And for my dad, he could have set that beer down. He could have walked across coming street and could have re-entered white society and never had to look back. And the guy sitting at the bar next to him looked over and said, can you take me with you? And my dad said that made him realize that he was in a, and it, it was, he was, it was white privilege. He had the opportunity to come and go as he pleased. So um, he, he got a really, um, and, he, and what he learned from Father Marcoux was a deep sense of humility. As a Jesuit, Marcoux had little or no ego. And my dad then kind of learned that. So most people that knew my dad would have never known he did any of that because he didn't talk about it. Um, but it, it, it's, it made him who he was. And like I said, he met my mom. 
And that's where our family was started. So it had a lot of impact on him. And then through the people he worked with and through the, you know, through his, the, his kids he raised. And so it rippled out. And in fact, when I asked him uh, in an interview, I said, what was the biggest impact the DeForest Club had? You know, and I'm thinking he's going to say, you know, it was this one picketing event or this one camp. And he said it was the impact on us, the impact on the members through what we experienced and what we learned. So um, it, it was everything to him. It was it defined who he was. Yeah. All right. And so, Lynn, next question I have for you. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the various protests and boycotts that the uh, the Poor's Club staged yeah. and uh, what were some of the outcomes from those events? Yeah, and that was that was Mark. Again, it goes back to none of this would have happened without Father Mark Koo. That was Mark Koo. He'd, he'd started early. They just talked about the, some of the theological implications of racism, and he brought in speakers. He would bring in like Leo Bahannon of the um, Omaha Urban League, and uh, but he also one time my dad and another white DePores Club member went to lunch with Bertha Calloway and her husband at a, a restaurant near Creighton, and. They weren't served and for my dad and the other white member it was they couldn't they didn't know what was going on and bertha calloway and her husband had to kind of take these two young white guys and say let us explain to you what just happened because they had never seen anything like that so my dad came back this was early on this was would have been 48 49 my dad came back and told father marcou about it and father marcou at the next meeting said we're going to cut the meeting short, grab your coats. We're walking down to this restaurant. And they walked into the restaurant and basically had an impromptu sit in and refused to leave until the owner would serve them. So my dad, at that point, that's when my dad said he realized it wasn't a prayer group. And he, he said he remembered being scared spitless, that there was like, whoa, this is not what I signed up for. And at that point, Father Marcou shortly said to my dad and the other members, if this club doesn't start doing some stuff, I'm, I don't want to be part of it anymore. So they, in the summer of 1950, they took on a, a laundry on North 24th Street. It was Ed Holmes Sherman Laundry. It's been the site of a, a simple Simon daycare on the corner of 24th and uh, Willis. And it was a laundry that in that neighborhood, it was in, in that neighborhood is entirely African-American. It was a white owned business and they refused to hire African-Americans except to work back in the washroom. And the divorce club approached the owner and said, hey, you know, you know, 80% of your business is African-Americans in the neighborhood. We think you should hire some African-Americans to work like to drive the vans, to work at the front office. And the owners were like, why are you even here? This has never been a problem before. So the divorce club did something that it shook it shook North Omaha and it shook the parts of Omaha that were paying attention. They started a boycott against the company and drove it out of business. And a year later, that the that company went out of business. They sold to another laundry. And a year later, that laundry then hired a black clerk. And a number of other laundries then started hiring black clerks because they did not want to be part of a boycott that would drive them out of business. So they took on a laundry in 1950. Uh, the next year they took on the Omaha Coca-Cola bottling company that had refused to hire African-Americans. Um, they actually worked with Whitney Young who was the head of the Omaha Urban League at the time. And he went on to be the head of the National Urban League. Whitney Young worked with them to negotiate. They, they boycotted Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola then gave in and hired a couple of guys and the divorce club said, that's nice that you hired those guys, but we want a written statement, a public written statement that you have changed your hiring policies permanently. And Coca-Cola said, well, we refuse to do that. The divorce club kept the boycott in place. Um, and this is actually a leaflet that the divorce club, you can see where it was taped up in the window of probably a storefront on North 24th Street. Um, Coca-Cola then changed their hiring policies and hired a number of um, black drivers and guys to work on the production line. 
Um, so there, there was the laundry, there was Coca-Cola. Um, but even before those two, they took on the Omaha Council Bluff Street Railway Company, which was the streetcar and bus company at the time. And they refused to hire. It was, and Eric, you always do a good job of pointing this out. This wasn't about where you were riding on the bus. This was about who was going to drive the bus. And the divorce club advocated to have the company hire black drivers. They first met with the ownership in May of 1948. And the ownership said, it's impossible. We, you know, we can't do that. It's, it, it goes against our policies. Society isn't ready for it. And then my dad, who would have been 22 at the time, said he remembers the vice president of the company dropping the ultimate reason, which was, if you know what would happen if we ever, in the last pass, a white woman, you know what would happen. And my dad said he could, he's just sat there and it's like, he didn't really just say that, did he? And they went back and they told Father Marcou what they had experienced. And Father Marcou right away said, yeah, I expected that. Let's go. And he moved them forward. But it took six years. The, um, the slide that Eric is showing now, one of their efforts was they knew a lot of people had to ride the bus because a lot of the people in North Omaha didn't have their own vehicles. Um, they actually talked about doing like jitney services and carpools like they had done, like they later did in Montgomery. But one of the ways was to try to get people to pay with the 18 pennies because the fare at the time was 18 cents. Um, they did that for a short while. You'd get on the bus, you'd dump your 18 pennies in um, and it would slow things down. Um, but they started in 1948 and it wasn't until 1954 that the Omaha Council Bluff Street Railway Company changed their hiring policy. And it was because the DePores Club built a coalition with the NAACP, the Omaha Urban League, to get the, to have the city threaten to take away the company's charter to do business. And then, and only then after six years, the railway company hired, changed the hiring policy and hired black drivers. The interesting thing was they hired women drivers throughout World War II because of the shortage of men, but they continued to advocate that African-American men were not qualified. And one of the things that the poorest club argued, they had picket signs that said, you got black GIs that are driving tanks and trucks and Jeeps. They can't drive buses in Omaha. So they, they, this, this was ongoing over a period of six years that they challenged the bus company um, and finally made a change in 54. And I believe this, this protest uh, occurred or ended uh, in positive results a year before Rosa Parks boycott uh, occurred down south. Yeah, and there's... So there's an interesting connection. Roy Wilkins, who was ended up being the head of the national NAACP at the time was a field representative and he was in Omaha to give a speech at a church. And he met with the divorce club leadership, asked him to meet with them and look at what they were doing for this boycott to see if he had any insight. And he it was actually the one that suggested they go after the charter of the company. But th that would have been in like 1952-ish, 52, 53. And Roy Wilkins then actually was an advisor to the Montgomery NAACP for their boycott. And like I said, some of the things like the carpools and those type of things that the divorce club shared with him were also implemented in the Montgomery. But this was... This came to an end in 54. The Montgomery boycott didn't begin until 1955. So Omaha had already had a boycott that had ended successfully prior to Montgomery, which um, is a hard thing for people to understand. Yeah. Well, and another thing I tend to point out to folks, you know, uh, where the one uh, sign talked about paying your fare with pennies. And I don't know if the DePores Club was thinking about it, but I know an unintended impact was at the end of the day, someone had to count all those pennies. And so that that probably added a little bit more work and a little bit more, you know, uh, things to their to their that they had to contend with that they they didn't necessarily plan upon. Yeah, and I actually in my research for the book, I talked to someone who had been at the bus company for a long time, and he said. That also would have that the the fare box on a bus would only hold a certain number of coins, and when it became full, 
they, you would have the driver would have to stop the route, drive back to the bus barn, have a supervisor take that full um, coin box, unlock it, take it out, put on another one. So there was that was another delay that um, that the drivers that it really really upset the drivers, but the company was able to ignore it. So yeah. So uh, there was also a, a boycott with the uh, Reed's ice cream. Yeah. So the, there were those were the four big ones over the four. They didn't start doing activities that were confrontational till about 1950. And from 1950 to 54, we already mentioned the laundry. We mentioned Coca Cola. We mentioned the bus company. The the one of the last ones was Reed's ice cream. It was right on the corner of 24th and Wirt. Um, again, right in the middle of the African American community. And when the Porous Club members went to visit with the owner, that his his response was, first of all, that they were un-American for coming and making him trying to make him do something he didn't want to do. But he also threatened that he would go out of business before he hired an African American at the store. And I that kind of flies in the face of business, but I'm not a businessman. So apparently it made sense to him. But so the divorce club uh, started a boycott and the, the, in the, you see in the middle of this flyer that Eric has displayed, it says, refuse to support this type of Bilboism. And I learned through research, there was a, a politician out of Louisiana, uh, Senator Bilbo, who was, you know, the poster child for white supremacy. I mean, that was his, he carried the, the flag for white supremacy and for um, discrimination and racism. And so that's where that, that term Bilboism comes from. But the, it, that quote was from the manager, we don't hire Negroes and we don't care if they buy our ice cream. Well, the divorce club started a boycott. It lasted for a year and the, the article in the Omaha Star that announced the end of the boycott said, after a year long loss of business, Reed's Ice Cream has hired a African-American saleswoman. And almost never did anybody, any of the businesses, in fact, those four businesses that we talked about, none of them changed their minds because they decided it was the right thing to do. They changed their mind because they were being impacted economically from the boycotts that the divorce club had um, instigated. Yeah, I, I always ask folks, is it because it's the right thing to do or is it because it's the green thing to do? It was, or it it was a mixture of both. It, um, there was a quote, I think something about basically speaking the language of a businessman is what they finally figured out. It's like, we can't convince them based on the moral argument or the theological argument. We're gonna speak a language that they understand, which is, but it was controversial when they first took on, because Mildred Brown and the star was a huge supporter of the Forest Club. She got lots of good stories and lots of good photographs that, you know, front page, a lot of those pictures are out of the Omaha Star. But even the Omaha Star, when the Forest Club took on that first boycott, they were, the, the Mildred Brown and the leadership of the Omaha Star, they were hesitant to take on a boycott because that was, that was crossing a line that you were attacking a business personally. And another thing that the divorce club did was they went to the World Herald, which was the, you know, the establishment newspaper at the time. And the World Herald didn't share anything about the divorce club. If you go back in the archives of the, of the Omaha World Herald, the divorce club didn't exist inside of the World Herald's archives. But the, the, the World Herald would argue that they didn't want to publish that kind of controversial stuff that attacked a business. And that was their rationale for not sharing what the divorce club was doing. So people that, when I do presentations on the divorce club, and I'm guessing there's some people listening today that are saying, I'm from Omaha. I grew up in Omaha. Eric, you grew up in Omaha and you had the same realization. I've never heard of the Omaha divorce club before. And it was because if you were white in Omaha, you didn't, know it because it wasn't shared in the news agencies of the time. And if you were black in Omaha, you, excuse me, you would see it in the Omaha Star. That was the, the one source. So if you lived outside of North Omaha, 
yeah. the history of the divorce club does didn't exist anywhere um and it wasn't in and and if you're the city of omaha and you're sharing your stories of your history that's probably not one that you want to put front and center so it, it was it, it just never was shared out and had it not been for the omaha star nobody would have known about what was going on but the interesting thing was a, a quick aside the Omaha Star was a member of the African-American Newspaper Association. So the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a large African-American newspaper, the Kansas City Star, um, the New York Amsterdam News, they carried stories about the Omaha Deporis Club more than the Omaha World Herald did because they were they were part of the, the newspaper agency and the Omaha Star would share those out and those other newspapers would pick them up. So their front page stories on the Kansas City call about the Omaha Deporis Club's uh, bus boycott. That that so people in Kansas City knew about it, but people in Omaha might not have known about it. Yeah, and I think also one reason why Mrs. Uh, uh, Brown was concerned too was because a lot of those organizations, although it was a black newspaper, they did advertising yes. in her yes. paper, and I yes. think you know, I know she was a little concerned about potentially losing losing business uh, from that. Yeah, so she I've was. Got, she was walking a thin line there. She was a businesswoman that had to pay her bills, and some of those people were her advertisers. And and so, yeah, so it, it created that kind of tension too. It's good that you point that out. Now, so do you think uh, the deport? Do you feel that the deports club would be relevant to today's uh, social unrest? And what role do you think they would play? Um, when I was watching the footage of the protests nationally last summer and I was looking at the the young people and the mix of men and women and boys and girls and black and white that what I was looking at the divorce club I mean it's it's the same message of young people um uh, Virginia Walsh who was a, she's in the that photo on the steps and she's actually still alive she's 93 I just visited with her the other day and she said that you it was just you understood that it was wrong and you couldn't help but try to convince other people that it was wrong and that's the same message that young people are acting on today that that the systemic racism that existed in 1947 that exists to to a lesser extent today, but still as part of of day to day life for African Americans, is still something that needs to be pointed out, brought out, discussed, challenged, changed. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think the divorce club. One of the things I and Eric, you and I just talked about this is when I when I would read things about the divorce club, it'd be like this this courageous group of people that fought racism or this, you know, and then it would stop right there. And it's like, wait, hold it, hold it. If there was a group in Omaha that existed to fight racism, where's the rest of that? That What was that racism? What did it look like? Who, who wasn't? But that part is almost always left off. But if you've got a group that's designed to fight racism, then there must have been a pretty good bit of racism. And that's the part that that is often left out. The the, the redlining of housing, the, the, um, the lack of job opportunity, the, the, the um, close to apartheid uh, lines of where people could live within Omaha. Um, so that is often left out. And I, that's, I think the power of the DePores Club is that it, kind of like Dirk Chatelain's book about 24th and Glory, he uses sports to kind of pull people in that to discussion. The story of the DePores Club pulls people into hearing a history about Omaha that they otherwise would not have had the opportunity to hear about. Okay, so now one last question and then we'll open it up for any questions that uh, viewers may have. If your father was, was here today, what do you think he would say about today's social unrest and, and injustice? When you sent me the questions, that's that's the one that stopped me. Um, he would be torn. I think he'd be a little disappointed that things haven't. Although he was, he died in two thousand and three. He understood that 
the the dent that a group like the De Forest Club made, it was a dent, but it was a small dent. I think he would be a combination of maybe a little bit disappointed, but he was also very much a realist. And I think he would understand that th that is a struggle that's taken hundreds and hundreds of years to that it's been in place for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's not something that's going to change uh, overnight. Um, so I, I think he would be encouraged that there are still people that have the courage and the, the wherewithal and the motivation to try to do something about it. But at the same time, like I said, there were times where he and even Mark Ku and DePores Club members became discouraged because they were pushing so hard, but they had such pushback from civic organizations, religious organizations, education, um, how, you know, realist, uh, it, to try to, um, the analogy that Father Mark Ku used, and I think it holds true today, was he said, it's like you're trying to push, push a semi up a mountain, all the tires are flat, you're the only one pushing and people are driving by and telling you don't go too fast. And Marcu said, go too fast. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it from running me over backwards. So still that idea of just having to push and push and push and push and sometimes thinking you're not making a difference. I think that the, the, the one thing I'll add, the story that of course, they were in existence nonstop for seven years. They met every week, often two or three times a week. They were doing things that made enemies uh, across the board. Yet they kept at it, and that tenacity, that perseverance, I've yet to figure out. Th that that's what fascinates me is just that that sense of coming back again and coming back again and coming back again and coming back over all that time. That's I think the power of that that story of the divorce. So for seven years they were they were getting in good trouble. Um, day after day after day, yes. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, thank you, uh, Matt. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Eric. open up for uh, any questions. We had one more question that I think wasn't answered. Okay. Um, Barbara was asking, did the Roosevelt administration have anything to do with the DePores Club? Um, no, because the DePores Club started in 47. That, that with my understanding that Truman would have been um, president then, but the ramifications of the Roosevelt administration's housing policies that created the redlining in minority communities would have been something that the divorce club would have uh, faced as, but th they did not have, they, they intentionally and consistently stayed out of politics. The, the, um, they did not engage in uh, candidates or political parties or any of that. So the, the answer to that, I would say pretty straightforward would be no. Okay. Um, and I linked to um, the Undesigned the Red Line exhibition at yes. the Union, if people want to virtually see that. We just did get another question. Is there a chapter of the DeVores Club today in Omaha? Oh, that's a question that comes out people want people want to believe that there's still somebody like that out there doing this. And the answer to that is no, there's not, but um, it, all it would take is a handful of crazy, dedicated, brave people with time and energy to make a difference. That's, they, they were, you know, you look at that picture, those are just a bunch of Omahans standing on those steps. There's nothing, none of them had any special training. Um, they just, they were, they were brave enough to meet and take it on. So, and I actually was approached, I was doing a display at the um, Omaha Star for one of the, um, it was Black History in the Village through the Empowerment Network. And a, a young lady who was a Creighton student came to me and said that she had met with some professors and they were talking about starting something like the Divorce Club on the Creighton campus. This was a couple of years ago and I never heard back, but there are groups in Omaha that are doing that type of things, you know, um, Black Lives Matter. I mean, those those are people with that same mindset to try to do something, make a difference. Um, but no, there is not a divorce club chapter. Well, I think that's the last question. Um, 
And yeah, Matt, thank you so much for sharing all of this amazing information. I shared information about your book um, okay. and also about Great Plains if people want to follow them on their social media. Um, Eric, do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I just wanted to mention we do have a opening up this uh, Thursday, our new exhibit, uh, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, this month is the month of August, which is when that event occurred back in 1963. So we have that exhibit that will be on display for a few months. Great, yes, everybody should stop by to see that. And then uh, our next conversation um, between Eric and Preston Love Jr. will be on September 7th, which is the Tuesday because September 6th is Labor Day. Um, so Tuesday, September 7th at noon. So I hope you all can join us for that. And we look forward to um, more questions. And then also our exhibition, All Together Amongst Many, Reflections on Empathy, is on view till September 19th. So still plenty of time to come see it. And um, please stop into the Bemis. We are always free and we are open Wednesday through Sunday. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Eric and Matt. And thank you, Rachel. Uh, hope to Thanks, see Eric. you all soon. Thank you, Matt. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Appreciate everyone. the opportunity. Thank you.